Hi, and welcome to another episode of Africa Business Weekly, where, of course, we bring you some of the most impactful business stories across Top Saharan Africa. I'm Akinobake. Of course, it's been a very eventful week for business news on the continent. But first, let's head to South Africa, where Morik Peterson is standing by to give us a breakdown of the key stories from the region this week. Thanks, Akin. On this week's Power Table, CNBC Africa hosted a panel of experts to unpack South African farming developments and what is needed to fix the sector. Fifi Peters spoke to Penny Byrne, the investment analyst for ESG and climate change at Standard Bank, Theo Diego, the president of the World Farmers Organization, and last but not least, Wandile Sithlobo, chief economist at Agricultural Business Chamber of South Africa for more. Let's listen in. Um, South African farmers have had to shift into more sustainable farming, into climate smart agriculture, absolutely. So we have seen a huge shift from that perspective. Um, I just get a bit nervous that the good rainfall has, has led to some complacency, more from, I suppose, a water uh, security uh, perspective. But in terms of adaptation, it's absolutely key. So agriculture is uh, kind of dual affected. We usually talk about climate risks in terms of physical risks, mm -hmm. and that's the risk of increased um, uh, extreme events and then also transition risks and that's the risk as we start to see more policy like the carbon tax come through uh, to try and reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions mm -hmm. and agriculture is one of the most exposed in both in terms of physical and transition risk. Mm -hmm. uh, the transition is happening too slowly for my liking. Um, last year 2021 we saw globally the highest ever emissions uh, on record. I expect 2022 is going to be even higher. So unfortunately, although there is a lot of a good discussion and a lot of robust debate around uh, climate change and trying to reduce emissions, we're not acting fast enough. And so in terms of the biggest risk over the next five years, um, I certainly do feel like the physical risks are what we need to worry about more. And therefore, adaptation is absolutely key. Right. Wandile, uh, coming back to you, and I'm uh, interested in your thoughts on smart agriculture right now and uh, whether the reason why perhaps as penny said it's it's not happening as quickly as she'd like is because it also is an added cost of farming in this environment whereby you have painted the uh, number of challenges that the industry is experiencing right now does cost have an element to the slow uptake yeah i mean i i would like to to remark and i think both penny and dr diaha have made very important points about the sector but i think we must have appreciation that this is a sector that has done so well you look at south africa's agricultural sector 1994 up until to today more than doubled in volumes and in value terms so there is a lot of good that has been happening onto that and to penny's point i mean um, uh, climate change increasingly a risk. Um, there's a risk of complacency going forward uh, to an extent as she alluded to. But Penny, I would say on that point, I mean, if you are a farmer, you, you don't hear about climate change or read about it. You feel it in your farm. If there is a drought, Dr. Diaha will see that hitting him on his farm. If there's floods, he will hit his leeches on the tree onto that. And in that context, then they have over time managed to say, how do they utilize technology to adapt onto that? And the technology developers have come up with shorter growing varieties of seeds and all kinds of things, which to a certain extent assist. But in the farming area, particularly in the grain sector, we've also seen a lot of conservation agriculture adoption practices. We're seeing a lot of no-till farming. All of these seem like a small measures, but I think they are part of the journey of us being able to cope with this climate change that we're seeing um, across the world. And of course, people look into even some of the agrochemicals that they're using. They're moving more friendlier practices into the farm. So I would say, Penny, from now, looking back maybe 10 years ago, we are in a far more better position um, than those, than those areas. But of course, there is always a gap and a room, which is what Dr. Diaho was talking about, to say if you look in Europe and elsewhere, there's a certain level of support that farmers do get from the government and stuff. Unfortunately, our finances in South Africa are not in a conducive place so that we could be able as agricultural sector to, to achieve and, and make those gains. Perhaps as a closing point into this, where we are receiving a bit of a, of a support, and it's the point that Dr. Diaha was making about unfair competition from elsewhere. We have what we call the International uh, Trade Administration Commission, ITEC, 
which is put in there under the DTI, looking at all of this trade environment and saying how can we use at least legislative measures to make sure that South Africa is in a best place. And I think they've been excellent over time. And I'm saying that, of course, as one of the people that is part of that organization. And I think we do look for welfare of South African farmers and consumers. For employment trends update in Africa's emerging decentralized renewable energy sector, we spoke to Power for All about their latest powering census report. To unpack recovery in job creation in the sector, CNBC Africa's Tanya Habamani spoke to Christina Skirka, CEO at the organization. Power for All itself is focused on countries which have 50% or less of energy access. Um, and so the, the countries in sub-Saharan Africa all sort of fit that demographic. And, and with that focus, that's really where decentralized renewables can make a great difference um, in the lives of individuals um, as well as countries. Uh, because the large majority of those without energy access live in rural populated areas, 85% actually is, is where that energy poverty is. Um, decentralized renewables that don't rely on a grid type connection to deliver energy are a great solution. And that's one of the reasons that Ethiopia, Kenya, Nigeria, and Uganda are all a focus, uh, but also because they have enough of a sector they're growing for us to be able to find a meaningful number of companies, survey them and understand from the real world experience uh, of these DRE companies, what it's like to employ and grow their companies locally. So in terms of uh, these uh, decentralized renewable um, fr from a job perspective, which of these have made the largest impact in terms of providing uh, job creation to those nations? Yeah, so I mean, I, it's an interesting topic and uh, this is very much a growing sector. Um, I, I would say we try to look at the sector as a whole, so decentralized as a whole across all of the different technologies. And today, that's grown from rooftop solar and mini grids to also include productive use. Um, right now, in some countries, we do see PICO and SHS, or solar home systems, taking the lead. But in other countries, we see mini grids right behind. So it's really dependent on the individual regulatory environment for a country, as well as the local political will and the funding that's available. Now, speaking of uh, the local political will, um, what can governments uh, do to act upon some of the findings that you've that you've made with this research? Yeah, it's uh, this is a great question, and I know it's a hot topic, uh, particularly in South Africa. But um, I, I think one of the things I'd love the government to hear is that decentralized renewables are a major and stable source of employment um, today, delivering you know, almost half a million jobs around the globe. And what's great is that these jobs have fits for people at all levels of skills and talents. And in terms of the political economy, what's really needed are a couple of things. I think one first is a credible market signal. So letting the DRE sector know that it country is very serious about making business easy for them to do. Uh, it's quite a patchwork of regulations. It's different in every country, um, different level of capacity in you know various uh, energy ministries, etc., to really understand and incorporate decentralized renewables. So that's one. Um, there's also a role in terms of funding and subsidy. Uh, one of the things that we've observed increasingly over the last couple of years is that there's inequitable access to subsidy. And so while it's great the number of governments are creating carve outs for decentralized renewables to actually deliver on their promises to their people about connections we don't always see that that is teamed up in the right way with uh, enough ease of doing business and access to subsidy and that's all from the southern africa broadcast team ed's back to you akin thanks marwick let's now move to east africa and find out some stories that shaped headlines this week Rwanda's economy grew by 7.7% in the first half of 2022 compared to 11.6% in the same period last year. That is according to the National Bank of Rwanda. The central bank further says that inflation remains a pain to the economy. We spoke to John Rangonga, the governor of Rwanda's central bank, for more. In fact, it's better than we had expected. Uh, uh, as, as you... So the numbers I had expected uh, annual growth of around six six uh, percent, uh, and uh, if you remember well, the, the first half was expected to grow uh, uh, slightly above six. Uh, so uh, I think there was 
uh, high performance of the service sector than it was expected before. So we saw the tourism related uh, services really doing extremely well, uh, hotel and services growing by above uh, 100% in the last first half of the year. Air transport growing above 100%. Uh, transport in general, uh, we saw uh, financial services continue to grow, communications, trade. So there was really uh, very good performance in the service industry beyond what we had expected because of the the global challenges, the inflation we are seeing that was hitting everybody around the world, that's inclusive. Uh, we had expected slowdown of the economic performance from what we had achieved last year. But yeah, so same with the industry, we've seen good performance in mining uh, linked to international global prices uh, of metals being high. We've seen uh, good performance in manufacturing. Uh, linked to one food exports we make in the region, uh, fortified food, uh, but also uh, cement that is exported in the region. Uh, yeah, generally speaking, it has been very good performance beyond what we had projected at the beginning of the year. Agriculture, on the other hand, uh, the agriculture mm -hmm. sector contracted, you know, one point, uh, the growth of 1.3 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You say much of that is because of the unfavorable weather conditions, but what you did say is how much of that uh, is a result of the impact of the inflation? Uh, are you able to, to, to indicate uh, the, the, the impact of the inflation on that? No, if anything, uh, agriculture is the cause of inflation than a, a victim of inflation. Though, yes, part of the slowdown in performance of agriculture was uh, uh, global prices of fertilizer that had gone up. Though government increased subsidy in the fertilizers, but still there was slight increase in what the, the farmer had to pay. So that came as a shock. And uh, so it's based on what we see from the Ministry of Agriculture, there was reduced use of fertilizers. So reduced use of fertilizers uh, coupled with issues of uh, weather not being that good, so it had general negative impact on uh, production of, uh, of agriculture. And that, uh, in fact, if agriculture had performed as was expected originally in the projection numbers, we had expected it to be around 2.7. If it had really performed to that level, uh, the overall performance of the economy would have been even much higher. So. But the biggest, biggest contributor to the slowdown in agriculture is uh, climatic conditions. And moving right across the border to Kenya, the United Kingdom has demanded that its exports to Kenya be exempted from the newly raised East African Community Tax Judges that took effect on the 1st of July, posing a big dilemma for Nairobi, which is bound by the regional bloc's decision. Odeambora Mogi, the CEO of Elim Capital, shares more. The ESC uh, came up with the ESC tax that affects all goods coming into the region uh, and was affected from 1st of July this year. Um, and and it's, so it affects all the countries involved uh, as long as you're importing anything into the region, then the, the tax takes place. Uh, so um, I think the, the, the idea is just to start rationalizing, harmonizing the fiscal policies of the countries and to enhance, you know, uh, equality uh, and, and, and income, uh, revenue income uh, for the community. Uh, it's an interesting development um, because we have not yet moved into a monetary union. Um, but it's a step forward in the customs union. Yeah, I mean, Odiambo, as you, as you have just said, it is a step forward in the customs union. Um, but how will that go ahead to impact the independent trade agreements that uh, different East African countries have with foreign parties? Well, it's a... <laughs> It's, it's a, a sort of a pickle. One, because uh, the, in, in Africa, we have the problem of uh, one country belonging to several regional economic communities. 
um, so that now you find um, a country like DRC would belong to ESC, would belong to the Central African, you know, the, the Central African countries, uh, will belong to IGAD, NEPAD, etc. So one country would be linked to several. So if, uh, for instance, now uh, DRC has um, an, an arrangement within the Central African Republic that uh, it is not to charge. It is not to charge taxes uh, from, uh, for example, Central African Republic. And on this other end, then we, they are being told, wait a minute, you have to charge the ESC tax on CAR. So it, it brings some sort of a pickle because they have to address that. But it is not just inter. Uh, it's not just continental or regional. Uh, it goes to multilateral arrangements made with countries uh, outside the region. For example, now uh, the permanent secretary in charge of trade in Kenya has expressed uh, that uh, the, the United Kingdom is complaining about the tax. The, we, uh, as a country, Kenya has um, a partnership agreement or a, an economic partnership agreement with the UK that uh, ensures that we will not charge uh, some taxes on, on several goods coming from the UK. Now the ESC demands that it, charge, it charges some, um, you know, some tax, the ESC tax on goods from the UK. And so that's a, that's a, a problem right there. It's a legal problem. It's an economic problem. And uh, that, the, that the, the country has to sort it. These are some of unique stories that are coming from East Africa this week. Thanks as always, Fiona. Now let's move to West Africa, now where the government of the Gambia has put in place a 10-year implementation strategy for the African Continental Free Trade Area. Earlier this week, we spoke to Aliu Seka, a transformation specialist at ABSS Consulting, on how this could translate into a competitive edge for the Gambia. Yes, um, indeed, uh, a few months ago, the Gambia government, uh, in partnership with various stakeholders, um, put in place uh, its new strategy for the AFCFTA. Um, it's very, should I say, exciting because, um, of course, the CFTA gives us opportunities um, that certainly excel and exceed much beyond the 2.5 million population in the Gambia. Um, so here we're all very excited, not only in the Gambia, but the 1.3 billion population of Africa, but particularly small countries like us, because um, the economies of scale that it delivers, um, certainly the increased markets that it delivers, um, FDI uh, opportunities it delivers to the whole of Africa are new ones. So we're excited to be part of this regime. Yeah, quite a lot played out because when you look at Gambia and you look at, uh, um, at the way the country is structured, uh, if you're going to take advantage of the AFC activity, more or less, there's quite a lot that trade infrastructure will have to play in this mix. Yeah, I'm trying to imagine how that will, 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 will pan out for Gambia. The president was talking about uh, the importance of the Senegambia Bridge. First of all, as I had mentioned, the increased market of Africa is huge. So for small countries and economies like the Gambia, um, it opens up this tremendous market. So certainly um, everybody wins both from the Gambian perspective, but certainly um, the entrepreneurs. Now, when you talk about the bridge, um, that is just one of the many corridors that Africa has to open trade between ourselves. Um, it has already seen some significant um, uplifting of transfer of goods, and services between the Gambia, Senegal, and elsewhere. Uh, we're still yet to develop other corridors, but I understand many are also under development. So I am pretty sure the Senegambia Bridge, uh, once we celebrate perhaps in, within five years, um, the growth and the transfer, the transport, um, should we say traffic that we've seen, will indicate that um, it's the beginning of this Africa continental free trade. 
Because uh, I see the government is taking quite a holistic strategy here as it looks to this implementation here. Because I'm seeing other aspects that are very crucial to the to moving trade that are also being addressed here. Case in point, the export strategy as well that the government is putting in place here. And I'd like you to speak to that and why that is also crucial uh, if, if Gambia is going to reap the benefits of the Continental Trade Pact. Um, mainly because of our size and our economy. Uh, the Gambia is a very small economy. So we see this huge um, market open to us for our entrepreneurs, but also for our government to increase its income and GDP. Um, you also would know uh, the very small interest rate that we do in Africa. Um, there is talk that uh, once CFTA uh, goes fully fledged, um, it should be able to um, increase as much as maybe 100%. Um, and certainly, we should be able to do trading more than 50% as other blocks in Asia, Europe, or America are doing. So I think um, the Gambia government has noticed or has uh, been made aware of this and has accordingly taken steps, including its new export strategy, setting up technical committees to look at the sensitive products list to see how we can deal with non-tariff barriers because that's an other impediment that um, Africans, uh, particularly entrepreneurs, experience regularly. All right, but Ali, because I'm now curious about the buzz on the ground now, the average small businesses, the mom and pop shops, the, the small entrepreneurs that are they're trying to get their goods there. Because I understand, yes, looking at the economy, yes, there's quite, there's quite a lot happening around the coast uh, of the Gambia in terms of uh, people making arts and crafts and quite a lot of other people uh, in, engaging other areas. That will. But I'm, I'm trying to imagine more or less the, how that buzz is getting to them, you know, uh, the small businesses and how the government is helping, to, uh, helping them to build the capacity to trade at a regional level? Well, um, to start with, um, there have been several trainings and sensitization programs organized both by the government as well as the private sector, particularly the Gambia Chamber of Commerce and the Gambia Export and Import uh, Promotion Agency. Um, increasing capacity uh, to make sure that these small entrepreneurs are able to develop uh, world-class products to start with, but also to formalize their business um, so that they can also compete with any other business. Yes, you mentioned the craft sector. Um, that's a thriving one because tourism is key in the Gambian economy. But there's also the fashion market. Um, there are many um, Africans who uh, prefer Gambian fashion and design. Likewise, um, ICT has opened up huge opportunities for the youth and the young to develop. The women are doing cross-border trade. So I think um, everybody can win from CFTA. Uh, we we'll just need to uh, get through the hurdles of perhaps getting the rest of Africa to sign on and open up. And the fact that now we have these seven pilot countries, I think gives us hope that we can learn from their experience. That was Alu Seka, a transformation specialist at ABSS Consulting. Now, away from that now, the newly released Country Climate and Development Report for the G5 Sahel region by the World Bank estimates that up to 13.5 million people across the Sahel could fall into poverty due to climate change-related shocks by 2015. Earlier, we spoke to Elisa Barudi, lead natural resource management specialist at the World Bank to discuss African government climate response financing alternatives and adaptation strategies. Um, I think when you think about the Sahel, you, it's really a question of uh, urgency because the situation in the Sahel vis-a-vis -vis climate change is only going to get worse. And right now we know that there's increasing temperatures, there's changes in rainfall patterns, we know daily issues related to flooding these days, but there's also in questions of droughts. So all of the imperative around climate change is with us today. What the report we uh, produced looked at was what are the economic impacts of this? And they're significant. We had to look at different scenarios because we don't know exactly what the trajectory is globally of emissions. We assume worst case scenario. If we do that, we're looking at a real impact on GDP from between 7 and 12 percent. If you look at less um, impacts you, uh, from climate, they could be a little lower. But um, I mean, we are talking about impacts on GDP that are significant, 
an impact on poverty, you mentioned the numbers by 2050, an additional 13 and a half million people pushed into poverty. Mm. So really important to take action. And talking about take action, taking action now, let's look at the how. Your expectations from African governments in pushing this uh, narrative towards adaptation. When you look at the reality one more time, uh, uh, these five Sahel region, uh, countries that form the G5 Sahel countries combined just contribute about 1% of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, yet they are the most vulnerable. And then we have about uh, $30 billion to fund the, uh, uh, the adaptation measures we, we're looking towards. Let's talk about the how, how African governments really now must take the conversations front and center. Yes, indeed, the how is critical and the how has to really change. I think uh, the report really looks at five different aspects. Two of them are cross-cutting. How institutions deal with climate change needs to be rewritten and rethought through. For example, is every question related to national budget and planning really including the questions of climate change? Today, not fully. So this is something that can change. In addition, we know there is a bigger need of financing. So the report delves a little bit into that. I think there is a little more room for private sector to come in. If that's the case, we suggest renewable energy is the good entry point for that. But of course, what you say on, in terms of climate finance, I mean, these countries are not responsible for the climate change we see today. They are at the, taking the brunt of the impacts, uh, but they can also see, you know, in terms of climate finance, we, we don't uh, say just go down the road of adaptation. The report really pushes the element of growth these countries do need more sustainable growth to be able to deal with the impacts of climate change, to be able to adapt further. So we suggest some areas where this is also worth going into. So looking at agriculture, environment and water in a different light, looking at renewable energy, big time to get more access, no energy, no growth. And then also how can we manage cities? Because there's a lot of urbanization, there's displacement of people, they're starting new agglomerations and those are not thought through. So, you know, you need to really think today for a planning down the road as well. And the report makes recommendations on that. Not to say other issues aren't important, but there needs to be a prioritization. And that was Elisa Barudi, Lead Natural Resource Management Specialist at the World Bank. Now, this brings us to the end of Africa Business Weekly. And a big thanks to Marwick and Fiona for the regional updates. I'm Akin Obake, and we'll be back same time next week for more weekly business stories across Sub-Saharan Africa. Thanks for watching.